Y... Grande Al Allora ragazzi, come state? Tutto bene? Matt, sei carico? Forse il 4 si torna a skateare? Eh? Sei pronto? Sei in forma? Uh. <ride> Yo, what up Kirill? How you doing? Nico, what's up? Brother Today we're going live with um, David McNamara The homie from Scotland, Glasgow, uh, owner of the website and once um, was also a <laughs> was also like a, a, a paper, or like a newspaper owner with the Wilson magazine. So, yeah, back in 2012, he came up with a couple of issues. No, I wouldn't say a couple, like more like four or five issues. No, six actually. So... That's pretty cool. <laughs> Grande Matt, sì sì, veramente, immagino. Immagino, minchia. Tempo di allacciarsi i pattini. Stanco. You! What's up, presidente? How you doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Definitely quarantine hairstyle. Am, am I gonna am I gonna take this uh, quarantine thing for make them grow <laughs> like a long hair? I don't know. <laughs> Alle sei tra tre minuti. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yo, Kirill, your your blading chat was pretty cool. I do really love it, and um, man. It's It's amazing. It has been super cool to talk with you. Looking forward to, to see you and skate with you. I would love to come in Moscow one day. <laughs> Sul mio tubo marcio. <laughs> Grande Ale. So let's invite <laughs> Thank you. Here like in Italy they are saying that the the 4th of May something might change. So I'm hoping for that. So we are able to go at least skate a little bit in the at the local skate park. But yeah. I'm so hyped. I'm looking forward for that. And also because of the job wise. What's up team? All right. Sir David is here. Sir McNamara. Shall we start? Or let's wait um, a couple of more minutes. Okay. He's down. So he's down. I'm down as well. Let's wait for David to be connected. Damn. And we are live. The, the Italian stallion. How are you doing? <laughs> Fine. Well, <laughs> the Italian stallion. Fine. What about you? You good? I'm good, man. Um, I'm actually working today. So this is the final hour of my, my shift. I'm working oh. in my, my home office, which is uh, my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> well, well, she runs riot around the rest of the house. So, yeah. Um, Yeah, keep them busy, but I'm good. How are you doing? You guys have been on lockdown life for ages. How's uh how's the new the new normal in Italy? I mean like right now, uh until the fourth of May everything will be the same as it was the ninth of March. So yeah, it will be like almost two months or like proper lockdown. And then like after the fourth of May, we're going to get into this thing that the government called the second phase, which is going to be Uh, reopening like the the majority of the stores and like in uh, working places and like factories and all that 
But yeah. of course, like taking all of those uh, social distancing and uh, all of those precaution, like the gloves or mask and whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I'm really care of is first thing first, like the reopening of the park so we are able to go skate. And then, of course, um, the rescheduling of the jobs that I had, like um, scheduled in, in March, but, and then they've been like postponed for who knows when. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy because Italy, Italy dealt with it so much better than the UK did. Like as soon as you guys started having like people with like cases, they just shut down everything, airports, businesses, everyone stay inside. The UK let people run around for weeks. And, um, like there was there was people dying, and yet the the bars were still open. It was just it was insane. It's cra It's crazy because like uh, I mean, of course we were the after China we were like the very first uh, uh, country being hit by by this disease, and like yeah. it's crazy how like within like those dating chats I was able to see that like every countries or like every people that I talked to did the same exact like mistake that we did like they didn't take italy as an example like hey those guys they did it wrong because they they underestimate the thing and like they let the restaurants and everything open for like two weeks and stuff like that and then like of course everything collapsed no like the, every country did the same thing that we did like unfortunately uk or spain or united yeah. states or and um, yeah like when even when the Prime Minister announced that they were closing all the bars and pubs the next day, I was driving home from work and all the pubs were full. So it's like, people are dying. The body count is just rising and rising and all you guys care about is going to the, the pub. And you're like, okay, so yeah, it's insane. But like, is it like the, the numbers are like different between like England and Scotland or like even in Scotland, like um, there's a lot of um, uh, infected people. Um, yeah, Scotland's got quite a high number. We've got, we've, yeah, we've, uh, we've got a hospital set up. Actually, we've got a couple set up just for um, testing. They've turned the exhibition centre into a hospital. So yeah, wow. it, I can't remember. I haven't, I haven't looked at the figures in a few days. So can't remember. I would assume they'd be much higher in, uh, in England. I know that there's a spike in London and particularly in the West Midlands, which is like kind of almost northern England. Crazy. Yeah. But yeah, we've had we've had a bunch in Scotland as well. And it's crazy because like the, um, Boris Johnson, at first he was like, um, it's just the flu, whatever. And then he got infected by that. <laughs> oh, but Boris Johnson's just the British Donald Trump. Like, he's just, <laughs> he's, he's just a, a, a clown figure, basically. I, I don't really, I can't really understand like how those people, like we had Berlusconi back then and like uh, how like, can get like voted and supported by the people. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really understand how how is it possible that like country like like UK or like uh, Italy can get like uh, can get those figures like you know up there to do to drive the countries. But I mean, just when, but then when the opposition isn't that appealing, it's easy True. for like it when you've got like just two terrible options. People just yeah so. Um, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy because like here in Italy, like uh, uh, before the last March, we were like on the way to be like um, uh, I wouldn't say rule, but like to get in the government. Those uh, right wing party called it Lega Nord, which is like uh, I wouldn't say like an extremist like uh, right wing party, but kind of. So yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. I mean, like, I don't want to get into the politics because I don't know shit about it. And I just, the only thing that I know it's from the newspaper that I read sometimes. And of course, the news from uh, from the telly. And uh, and so, but they're all, they're like, when I did like this thing with Chaz, I forget to ask him one thing. Like, did like the queen um, have any uh, weight, like politically wise? Um, she's not actually allowed to interfere with parliament. So, okay, like, uh, if Boris Johnson or, like, whatever, he's, like, uh, right there in the parliament, like, they can do whatever, and she's, like, on the side, and basically... They're, the way it kind of works is, like, they're answerable to the monarchy, but the monarchy aren't allowed to affect, okay. aren't allowed to influence government. They're not allowed to, like, basically, yeah, impact that. And, you know, I don't know if you, if you know it, but, like, here in Italy, 
like the people are going crazy for the royals like they 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 mad like they they love all of those gossip thing about like uh uh lady diana yeah. the queen the queen mary like all of them like it's yeah people are upset like that's that's why i assume they're still it's still kind of tolerated because they have such insane tourism revenue for the country like people always complain about how much like the royal family costs us the royal family brings in billions of pounds worth of tourism every year true true like yeah for example buckingham palace like uh, just, yeah. just just to see the people that standing in front taking picture of the of that like palace it's, it's crazy right yeah people are upset people have never been the uk are not british are obsessed even people in the uk there's so many of them that are obsessed with it yeah crazy crazy and like um, yeah sorry what were you going to say No, no, like the other day, like after the Chaz one, uh, I think Scott, like, sent me, or, or Bruce, I can't remember who sent me the link, I think Bruce, uh, the link for uh, Hidden Forces, uh, the, the, the skate video. Uh, I don't know if you remember it, like, uh, early days of Chaz Sands, he was skating the K2s, Chris Toady okay. was in there. Is it the one, yeah, I had all the footage at uh, Blackfriars in London. Uh, yeah, exactly, with the Yanis Bob, uh, Yanis Bob. Yanis Bob, yeah, yeah, and... At, at uh, Leon, Leon goes at like some stupid like 20 miles an hour at a top so and then just hits all the support exactly. and dies. Yeah, Damn. The, the, yeah the was, was, was crazy. Like, were you skating back then? Like, how long have you been skating? Yeah, um, so I started in, I started when I was 13. So I started the year that, I started the year that Jeff Loretto won like Rookie of the Year at Nest. So... Uh, yeah, I was either, was either 1994 or 1995. Hope 3 had just come out. Damn. <laughs> Hope 3 had just come out. And then I'd actually wanted to skate for six months before that. So my birthday's on June 22nd. And that summer I saw the British Inline Championships on Sky Sports. And I saw, I don't know if you remember Ben Jagger. Mm, no, to be honest. He used to be sponsored by Oxygen and he ran Wakefield Skate Park and uh, he was, they had a clothing company called Puberty Clothing and he just absolutely destroyed uh, the course. And I saw that and I was like, oh my God, that looks amazing. I want to do that. And then they started showing Ness on Sky Sports and watched like Randy Spicer doing Disaster Souls and Champion Bombs yeah. Miller and John Julio. And as soon as I saw those guys, I was like, yeah, I want a pair of rollerblades. But my birthday just passed. So I had to wait until Christmas. Oh my goodness. But, but they kept putting like a new show on like every week for like Nest or ASA or like, like there'd be some Bear Sea thing or like, yeah, some kind of ask. So, I, and then I discovered there was all these magazines. So I'd go to, down to the local news agent like every week to check if there was a new issue of Inline Skater or Box Magazine or Daily Bread. And Unity was still not a standalone magazine then. It was just like a part of a bigger magazine called Inline Skater Mag. And I had, by the time I actually started rollerblading, I'd, I had about five hours worth of skate competition footage on a VHS and I had all these magazines. So before I even put a pair of skates on, I knew all the trick names, all the skaters, all the clothing companies, like just everything. And then I put a pair of skates on on Christmas Day, rolled down my driveway, fell backwards, gave myself a dead ass and I was like, oh my God, this is really painful. <laughs> and I was like, I've made a terrible mistake. Like, this really hurts. And it took a, and I got back up and kept going and kept going and I had like so many bad falls. I came back into the house on Christmas Day for dinner, just like covered in bruises. All my clothes were ripped. My parents were like, what the hell have you been doing? <laughs> and yeah, and just from then, I just never, never stopped. Never But, stopped. Yeah, you say about Chaz, um, weirdly, I started skate, uh, around about the time I started skating, Brian Adams Uh, started skating as well. He won, he won, I think he won an IMYT and he came joint first. He was the first person to have a pro wheel for undercover. Yeah, undercover, I remember that. And the yeah, IMYT um, was IMYT in Liverpool, isn't he? I, yeah, I think so. When he skated um, super well at the IMYT and uh, he skated well as well uh, in Amsterdam. I think, yeah, I think Al Hui won that, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure Al Hui won that with like the Royal, three, Royal 270 top, so either oh, way, yeah. yeah. 
But um, yeah, so Chaz started skating around the same time, but um, yeah, so I, w- I, w- I lived about an hour outside Glasgow, so I would travel to Glasgow every weekend and stay with Brian, and Brian Adams and Chaz Sands were best friends. Damn. Uh, is it Brian still skating? Because I haven't seen him skating in ages. He skates once in a while. Um, he still comes out. But yeah, he's like, he's a rapper. He's released an insane amount of albums. They're all on Spotify under this thing called Gasp. And um, just plays shows all the time, produces. So yeah, he's just doing that. Busy. But he does he does still come out and skate once in a while. Oh, great. We do have like this question from Jeff. He asked you how many Unity uh, did you collect? Well, Unity Magazine or Unity Tricks? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, because there's, yeah, you only ask him to specify. If it's Unity Magazine, I, yeah, I collected all of them. And weirdly, towards the end, for the last couple of years, I wrote for them. Um, and then I started writing for BMAG, and I did a couple of things for one. And then after living in London for a couple of years, doing music journalism, that's why I started Wheel Scene. Okay, so... so magazine, yeah, you... I, collected, I collected all of those, yeah. Damn. I had, I had before issue one. I had it. I had it when it was a pullout in another magazine. Wow, that's crazy! I so always it, have like all of the daily breads. I meet. I miss like twenty issue. Like no, eighteen issue. Like the very first one, like from number one until like number seventy. And Unity Mag. I, unfortunately, I do have only six or seven of them. They were quite nice, huh? Did they? Someone, someone's just wrote, did you get paid for writing for Unity? They were notorious for not paying people. Weirdly, actually, I did get paid. I got paid <laughs> something like £50 an article. And then when the magazine closed down, um, I think it was Steve Glidewell or Andy Critchlow, I can't remember. But yeah, weirdly, I was living in South Korea at the time, teaching English. And my dad said, oh, you've just got this random letter in the post. And I was like, yeah, it's fine, open it. And there was a cheque for £200. So... Yeah, that was nice of them because I didn't actually realize I was even going to get paid. Because his brother, he said, like Bruce says, my brother gave up after writing for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weirdly, I'd, I'd never actually discussed money with them or even asked for money. I just wanted to be involved and, yeah, write stuff. And they just sent me checks. Yeah, so. Oh, perfect, perfect. But, like, so I, I suppose, that, like, back then, how, because there was, like, or maybe there, there were, but, like, I do believe that the connection was like pretty slow and stuff. How were you able to send them the articles and like to, to write them the articles? Were you proposing to the editor in chief like the articles or like uh, you were able to do like a couple of them? And... Um, it was weird, yeah, because like obviously I was, I knew people that were sponsored, like I knew like Chris Doughty and Brian and Chaz and stuff like that. And um, used to read the magazine all the time and I just thought, the writing in it just absolutely sucked. Um, like, it was just really terribly written, or there'd be loads of typos, or just the grammar was awful. So I remember just basically writing an email, telling them, like, how bad some of the articles were, and actually pointing out, like, the mistakes in them. <laughs> and then they were like, well, if you think you can do better, send us something. And I did, and literally the first article I sent them, they published it, and it was like a five-page article. And then ever since that, oh, then someone did a John Julio interview and they absolutely butchered the intro and like, like it was just really, really badly written. And the guy that ran the magazine sent it to me and just went, can you just fix all of this? And I just basically rewrote it. And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it was just pestering them via email. Yeah. Okay. I, was at uni- I was at university at the time. I remember that. Yeah. So it must have been like, yeah, sending them like Hotmail or Yahoo Mail or something <laughs> all those things and what are you doing right now like what is your, your like current job uh, i do i work for a company that provides subtitles for deaf and hard of hearing people so we our clients are like the bbc and uh, channel four and channel five and stuff like that and like most of the major tv channels in the uk and um, so yeah do that it's, it's a pretty easy enjoyable job Perfect, perfect. But uh, in Scotland, are you able to go out a little bit, or you have to yeah, stay at home? Um, yeah, it's like a it's a lockdown, but it's not strict. It's basically don't congregate in places. Most most places are closed, apart from supermarkets and the odd like takeaway uh, restaurant stuff. But yeah, and most a lot. I wouldn't say most people. That's kind of harsh. But no matter what public park you go to, it's busy. Okay. Oh, really? Like it's, 
and there's police everywhere. There's police everywhere telling people not to sit on park benches or not to do this and that. But yeah, like I've never seen so many runners and cyclists in my entire life. It's like the whole, it's like the whole of Scotland either taking up running or cycling. Um, and, and skate shops must be making an absolute fortune because every every time I go on Facebook, there's a new person saying, bought my first pair of skates in like 25 years. Bought my da -da 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 -da. And it's like, you're in for a world of pain. If you haven't rollerbladed in 25 years, the first time you fall, it's going to be an earth-battering <laughs> pain because I never stopped. And it still hurts. So, <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Like but everyone, sorry, no, yeah, no, everyone thinks ahead. skate shops are suffering, but skate shops. I imagine in the past couple of months, skate shops have done more sales of recreational and big wheel, big wheel skates than they have in as far back as they can remember. Earlier, I was talking with with Marco Valera, which is like a, a good friend of mine. Is like the the production manager of Approach or Araches, and he just okay. told me that like. Uh, uh, the, the last like month or something they had like the highest numbers of sales of fitness skates in scandinavia like they never had like this amount of like sales up there because of probably this thing yeah. like uh, gyms maybe are closed or something like that so people need to find like a recreational things and they, they just buy skates because they need to go out and, and do their own thing so maybe it could well, be a good yeah. thing yeah, most, most people aren't working and they've got all this free time in their hands and the reason most of them stopped skating is because they didn't, well, they, they didn't feel as if they'd enough free time or they just didn't want to make the free time. Now all they have is time, so it makes sense that they would return to something that they once enjoyed. True, true, definitely. And uh, so, like, going back to what you are saying about, like, your, your writing career and stuff like that, after one, you made that thing. <laughs> And I didn't realize that you're in the cover right now. <laughs> Shit, I do look a lot like that guy. Yeah, there's so I get so much crap for like any bald celebrity with facial hair because we all just look the same. It, yeah. Um, How did it they, happen? Ev everyone just calls me the shit Ricardo Lino now. Uh, I just get that, so that's that's good. <laughs> Um, when I met Ricardo at Winter Clash for the first time, people were flipping out and taking photos, and it was just yeah. Um, how did what happen? Um, the Wilson magazine. So, um, oh, no, no. Just, let me just let me just say this thing first. I do really would like to thank you for like the opportunity you gave me in this issue to be on it. So really, thank you so much for, for that. It was like a, a super like honor to me, and it was cool because a, a friend of mine who lives in the in the in the in, in London, and she she was like, "How did the hell in the world happen that like I got this." newspaper in my hand and i saw you here in this magazine yeah it was okay. crazy yeah we managed to get that in so many bars and mu because it had so much music content in it lots of bars music venues and nightclubs would stock it and record shops so we managed to get rollerblade magazines like we were printing at one point we were printing ten thousand copies of each issue and it was going all over the world so um yeah, so that was nuts. Uh, how did it start? Uh, I've always wanted to be a journalist. Um, when I finished university, I went to Korea, uh, South Korea for a year and taught English. And the whole time I was writing articles for magazines and writing a book. And then I came back and tried to get the book published. Couldn't get it published. So I just worked various jobs for a year. Went to London, ended up doing music, uh, working for a music magazine called The Still Pigeon there and working for a... Uh, extreme sports magazine called Huck magazine which is still going um, and just worked there for about a year and a half and then by the time I'd done that I kind of knew everything I needed to know to start my own magazine so I was just like why am I doing this for other people writing about like surfing and snowboarding and skateboarding and stuff when I could be writing about rollerblading for myself so I just came home um, I had a thousand pounds <laughs> And I went to my bank that I've been at since I was a kid and said, I want a £5,000 business overdraft and I have a £1,000 to put into it. And they were like, <laughs> okay. No way. And the first issue of Wheel Scene cost like £2,000 and just instantly started going into the business overdraft. And like, you know, just, yeah. So managed to keep it going for a few years as a print magazine. And now it's just, yeah, the website that I do for fun when I'm not working or being a dad or 
falling over on rollerblades. Uh, so, yeah. It's good, like the concept, it's like you were saying, was pretty cool because, I mean, you were like able to show blading in places where like you weren't able maybe to, to get blading into it. Like, like uh, for example, this friend of mine who I don't know how, them, I really didn't like, I have to ask her like how she was able to reach out this magazine, especially to, to like to find me into the, into the magazine because probably like she went to the spot, like she opened it and like she, she was probably looking at it. I don't know. I mean, I mean thank you so much. And uh, your, name, was, your name was in the front cover. She might have just read your name. No, no, I mean, it wasn't no, here. No, oh. I mean, I'm really? realizing right now there's Derek Anderson here. So later on, I'm going to check it. And I, I'm like in page 20 or something like that. So, so like, she was like really flipping the pages and uh, have a look at it. So, I mean. It's probably, it's probably one of those one things that was in a bar and she just picked it up and started flicking probably. through it and then went, oh. Probably, probably. And how many copies you guys were like, uh, uh, it, it was only you or like, there were like people working for you or with you? Uh, so I had two guys helping me, but they, the only thing they did was the, the actual layout for the magazine or the newspaper, whatever you want to call it. I did everything else myself. Wow. And it was Which, like insane what, because it's like kind of a thick magazine, huh? Yeah. Uh, I met, I met Jay Keeley, uh, the guy that runs the local. Um, and I'd met him a few times doing stuff for Slam Jam because I used to help out there as well. And I saw him after like the second or third issue and he was just like, I can't believe you're putting this out so quickly. He's like, these are coming out like every few months. And I was like, yeah, I was like, if we just had the infrastructure and the money, I was like, I could, I could fire these out like three or four times a year, easy. The, the, the thing that stopped them coming out so, so like frequently is because I didn't have the advertising money. If, mm. if I had the advertising money or if people paid it on time, I could have easily brought one out every two months. But how many, how many doing, is on, like... doing it on my own was too hard and being responsible for everything was just a dumb idea. I should have got more people involved because I was doing the tax, I was doing all the advertising, oh my chasing up photographers, writing everything. Like yeah, it was it was it was too much for one person. You need a you need a team. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so it worked in the short term when I didn't have a kid. Now if I want yeah. I, I would love to get involved and do something like that again, but you would need a solid crew around you. Jeff is saying like Roll Kings wouldn't pay up. Would he's, they? He's, he's joking. It's because our mutual friend, uh, Stuart, owns Roll Kings. I think they only ever took out like two adverts, but yeah. Um, yeah, Jeff's just been a dick. <laughs> hey, Jeff, anyway, I, I was able to reach out those three videos from my jet because... Freddie White sent me. So this is a message for Jeff. <laughs> and um, so going back to the to the UK scene, um, have you ever skated? Like I never met Richard Taylor. I have only seen him once mm -hmm. at IMYTA uh, 2004. Uh, so probably like a couple of weeks or like a month, probably the day he passed. And um, like, did you get any chance to skate and hang with him? I only ever saw him at competitions, and he was like he was like the UK's Chris Edwards. He was like like the rocket man. He was the loudest guy in the room. He was always doing the biggest airs. And even when, at that time, he was very much not like, like um, how would you say, like the kind of like in-trend rollerblader. Because at that time, everyone was doing like ridiculous switch-ups on handrails and trying to be as like gangster and hard as they could. And Richard Taylor just wasn't that guy. He like all he cared about was like putting on a show and making it like as much of like a spectacle as he could, but yet everyone still loved him because he was just like that guy. He was like very charismatic and just yeah, he was like Chris Edwards. Even when Chris Edwards was competing in the X Games towards the end of his career and getting slaughtered by all these like young kids like Aaron Feinberg and stuff like that, people still loved seeing Chris Edwards because he was a showman and Richard Taylor was a showman. Damn. Damn. I wish I was able to 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 meet him because he looks like one of those people, super like uh, warm and like really welcoming and super happy and all the time like super like giving you juice and stuff like that. Was he? Yeah, I only ever spoke to him like once or twice. I didn't know him well at all, but yeah, everyone spoke very very highly of him, and um, 
yeah it's it's quite funny when i think about things like cause you think about people that everyone's like oh he, like it's the same with quinny like scott quinn everyone's like god he's such a lovely guy he's so kind and i always just think i always wonder that about richard taylor because i know quinny really well and like we hung about a lot and everyone thinks quinny's such a lovely sweet kind guy but i know for a fact that he's a sarcastic arsehole and like private and like he's it's, it's got such a vicious sense of humor so <laughs> I just wonder if it's kind of the same with Richard. Everyone was like, God, he's such a sweet, kind guy. But all his friends were probably like, no, he could actually be like quite a dick too. But we just, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've never heard anyone say a bad thing about Rich. And then, so just because you started skating like that long time ago, and since the beginning, you were like a, kind of a, into those media and all that. Like, can you talk, like, can you tell me like your top three skating videos? I think it's oh. a tough one, huh? The first, well, the first video I ever saw was Hoax 3. So it's all, Hoax 3 is always going to be there. The first video I bought and owned myself was VG4. And as soon as I saw that and saw Jason Marshall, I was just like, that guy is the shit. Like, <laughs> Jason Marshall and John Hillio. John Hillio is probably my favourite skater of all time. Um, it would be like John, Randy and Champion, just because that was the era that I started in. Um, but yeah, VG4. Uh, weirdly, one of the ones I've probably watched the most in the last 10 years is uh, Strange Creatures Voodoo Show. Oh, wow. I just remember being so blown away. I love the aesthetic. I love the fact that it's all these like guys that look as if they could be in an indie band, but just happen to be incredible at rollerblading. Um, Amir Amadi makes great videos. He made Alex Brosco's Nowhere BOD, which was just insane. Crazy. Um, yeah, VG4 and Hopes 3. Uh, any video is probably going to be a video that had a John Julio section in it. If the video had a John Julio section in it, I bought it. That was just, that was like the rule. Um, or Louis Zamora. I was obsessed with Louis Zamora as Man. well, which was really hurtful because um, after I started Wheel Scene, we had a really, really like, like kind of better fight so yeah that was kind of you know like when you have like one of your heroes and then you have an interaction with them you're like shit really wish i just hadn't had an interaction with you um, no way really yeah yeah he, like i interviewed um peter that ran that runs adapt and just asked him what happened because uh louis was skating adapt skates when he made his comeback and then randomly switched to valo and i was like oh what happened there like Basically, just asked. I didn't know anything about it other than he wore them. He was getting free skates for a little while, and he wasn't. And Peter said that he wanted a pro skate, and he wanted them to like change up the way we do the production and stuff like that. And then when the interview was published, Louis just decided that it was my fault that Peter said this stuff about him, and was really angry at me. And I was like, "You can't ask the questions. I'm not. I'm not responsible for how people answer." And he was just really quite, yeah, surprisingly immature about it. So. I was, yeah, it was just a bit disappointing. Crazy. It's bad, it's bad. Like, I bet that it's kind of a sad when you see, like, when you idolize someone and yeah, then it I, turns I out like, like... Yeah, I would I would never, yeah, I would never knowingly talk shit on Louis. I've never met Louis. And so when he was, like, so pissed at me and thought I was a complete dick, I was like, oh, that's kind of bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. And then, so, yeah, those three videos, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. God, what was, every time a video groove came out, it was just insane because that was the only media that we saw regularly in the UK. Like when you went to skate shops, they would always have like a video groove and just the level of progression between each yeah. video. You'd learn, all, you'd learn all the tricks in like VG4. You'd learn all like the unity and the top acid and the, the sidewalk or whatever. And then the next one would come out and everyone's doing like a spin onto a grind or something or like doing four switch ups. And you're like, shit, I just learned all this stuff. <laughs> and now I need to learn all this. And then every time a new video came out, you couldn't keep up. And it was just, yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, is medium, medium smell the glove. Is, uh, yeah, mm. medium smell the glove. I got that for free when I ordered something from a skate shop. And I just wasn't expecting anything. I saw the first medium in video and I hated it. I thought the quality was just terrible. <laughs> like, they had great skaters in it, like Champion and Dustin Latimer and stuff like that. But the actual quality of the footage was just awful, even for the time. And then Medium Smell the Glove came out and I was like, that's just 
destroyed my little teenage brain. It was just so aggressive and violent and had all this like angry music in it and just uh, Shane Saviors is like smashing his face open and <laughs> and then just getting up and doing it again, even though blood's pouring down his face and I was just like, this is, yes, this is what I want. <laughs> yeah. So. It's crazy. Um, fast, yeah. says uh, Jeff. Yes, yeah, and fast is pretty cool. Stand Fast was really good, but by that point, Senna had kind of stopped being cool. Like, they still had amazing, they had amazing skaters, but, like, all the people who made Senna what it was were gone. Like, Petty was gone, uh, Randy was gone, Louis was gone, like, and they basically just drafted in all these new guys because they suddenly had all this money from Bravo, and it was like, and they had that army theme that <laughs> Hated, like, hated all that With the graphic and all that. Yeah, no, it was like something like shit GI Joe theme. <laughs> no, no, that was awful. But this game in it was incredible, and it had a Blake Dennis section, and Blake yeah. Dennis was so ahead of his time, doing like full cab true top styles and like, yeah, damn. Top down kinks and five fourteen off the end. Like that was just psycho. Um, before that, before doing this, I was wa uh, watching this video called Oblivion from Los Angeles. Uh, probably 2004, 2003 thing. And I was watching um, One Fung profile. Do you remember One Fung? One Fung, yeah, the, um, God, he was like, hey, oh, I don't want to get this wrong and sound racist. Uh, Filipino or Asian? Uh, Chinese, I would say, probably. Chinese. And yeah. he, he was like, damn, it was crazy. And but it, it, I mean, I don't want to say like- guys, though, they, were, they, were in a, they were in a crew called the Oblivion Crew or something. Exactly, exactly. And they had, um, because Gonzo. Gonzo, Gonzo was in it as well, yeah, and they were, yeah, they were insanely yeah. good, yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And like, just like you were saying, but, but I don't want to say, I don't want to look like too nostalgic, but like every video they were like coming out, like uh, at that time, especially those video group, they were like video after video after video, they're like, the, the trees were like, able keep on evolving, and they were like creating in, in, in some way those characters, like people like, like us, Bladers was like looking for like you know being inspired and like has like a an, an inspiration or like someone to emulate somehow right yeah and it's just it's insane the things you remember from those videos because they didn't like for example a video comes out now and it's just not as special which is kind of like sad like someone will pour their heart and soul into a section it will be absolutely brilliant it will it'll blow you away but then in a week you if someone tells you, have you seen it in good recently? You actually can't remember it, even though it was like, say for example, like music, there will never be like iconic songs that you'll sing along to when you hear them on the radio from skate videos anymore because of copyright. True. Like, like every time you hear the notorious, be it, every time you hear um, like Biggie Smalls party and bullshit, you think of Frankie Morales. True. Every time you hear jukebox hero, you think of Aaron Feinberg. Aaron Feinberg, yeah. That stuff will never, ever leave your brain. That is stuck in your brain for the rest of your life. When you're an old-ass man and that song comes on the radio, you'll be like, Feinberg. That's it. And it's never going to happen anymore because, because you can't use popular, iconic music. You can only use weird, alternative, like, underground, unsigned stuff. So it's just not going to have that same effect. And what you're saying there, it reminds me of... Um, when Jeff Frederick had uh, clips in Coupe d'Etat and in Stanfast, I instantly remembered who he was from a single clip he had in a VG where he did a 360 top stole in White Majestics. That will never happen again. Like, you will never remember one clip from a video like five years before. Yeah. Like, he, was, he was skating in like pre u pre-UFS Majestic 12s, but I instantly just remembered him. As soon as I saw the name Jeff Frederick, I was like, that's that guy from Philadelphia. And he's still doing like 360 top souls. And I was just like, so yeah, just stuff like that. I, I don't know. Like, like, Jeff, I, I, Jeff I, I just do... pointed out the Joey Chase VOD, which was amazing. And I absolutely mm -hmm. loved it. I've watched that at least 20 times. I love Joey Chase. <laughs> Definitely super intense. And going back to for what you were saying right now, it's the fact probably to me, it also because you know maybe back then we weren't working like we didn't have like responsibility or something like that 
or just maybe because like we were watching those videos and there right there was like no distraction like the cell phone or something like that no oh it's because you were studying them like you would you would get i broke so many vhs tapes from watching them too much i bought um i got brian smith's unsuitable material suitable material and whatever i had a josh petty section in it and I had like Nick Podrick and stuff like that, and like all the old like like California guys. I watched it so much that the tape just like destroyed, like the actual tape, like it just came apart. That's never going to happen again. Like no, so am I. Actually, that's not true. I guess now with Alex Brosco sections, like if, I, if Alex brings out something, I will I will probably watch it at least ten or twenty times. No, I mean like yeah, so am I. But like for example, I find more, but maybe it's the nostalgia effect or whatever. Um, enjoyable watching more VG19 or 4.2 or something like that, more than like uh, the, the view. Even if like, for example, Breeze from from Niels, I've, I've watched it like, I don't know, 10, 12 times because it's really good, well made and everything. But I don't know, for some reason, I find more uh, inspiring, like watching 4.2 or like 4.3 or I don't know, something from the early 2000s. Probably because, you know, the nostalgia effect, like uh, they get me like into the zone in, in my head. It was like, okay, yeah, when I was kidding with my friends and all that, I don't know. I, 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 I fully, fully appreciate that. I get it and I understand why people do. I'm actually the opposite. I can't do it. I hate it because it, I just look back at it and remember how just sketchy like all the landings were and how slow everyone skated and how awful the clothes were. Hated that period of rollerblading. I remember when it came round because I started when it was like all like punk and alternative and like everyone was into like rock. And then like the gangster rap phase started mm -hmm. and everyone started wearing like triple XL sweatpants and I just couldn't do it. I've never once worn a pair of sweatpants rollerblading. Really? And when everyone started wearing that and dressing like that and acting that way, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like mm -hmm. it's, turned, it's turned from this like outsider sport into like kind of like jockey hard man like like toxic masculinity thing so when that phase passed and people you started getting like little like emo kids wearing skin tight jeans i was like thank god for that because <laughs> i can't i can't deal with omar y song wearing bright red like full tracks no yeah. this that was too much in my opinion like all of those ready like i mean sweatman's triple xl it was already too much but then when people start to like wear like completely like double XL, minute, yeah. triple XL like sweatpants, red, I mean, dude, dressing up like candies, I mean, come on. It just, it just made me like, and all my friends dressed like that. I was like the only guy that just wore like baggy jeans and you'd go to a bar with them after skating and I just, <laughs> I just felt embarrassed. <laughs> with Santa Claus. <laughs> But yeah, weirdly, like, loved Chaz skating, and he used to, like, dress like that, wearing colour-coordinated shit. Loved Vinny, loved um, Vinny Minton, and he used to wear, like, the all, like, yellow and blue or something, like, terrible outfits. So, yeah. Um, and Jeff's just pointed out one of my friends still dresses like that. Yeah, Scott Riddle still dresses like that. And um, I'm embarrassed to be around him. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> he knows that I'm so fine. And then, so, like, with that being said, like... Um, after all this thing happened and, and like uh, we are going to be able to travel and to, to skate around with no problem, which are like going to be your future projects? I've got three videos sitting on my computer unfinished. Uh, I've got a full length, full length street video that's half filmed. It's got like five sections from Scotch guys. We've got a park section from one of the guys, Elliot Proven, that just needs like a few more sessions and it's done and I've got a product review that's sitting half done so, so there's all this stuff there's all this stuff that they're ready to work on that I can't work on so it's just infuriating okay great great so you're going I've to be always, busy I've, I've got like I've literally got uh, every time I get a new phone I have to transfer the note from one phone to the next with all the projects I want to finish uh-huh so it's just like all these like short film ideas or da, 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 like all of them are blading related that are just some of them will probably never I'll never get around to but yeah they're all sitting there the idea the idea is there just the time and the resources and the people to do it with isn't always there one of them could be you and your family come here in Milan as soon as like all of this thing will will be done 
I've never been to Italy. I don't know how that's possible because how can obsessed, obsessed with the food and Italian women, they've all got they've all got the the big hips and the the dark hair and the dark eyes. That's 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 if, yeah, that's that's my thing. So yeah, I don't know why. But um, you have to, you have to like maybe one like when like all of those flights are going to be able to to, to go into countries and stuff like that. I mean. I'm kind of, yeah, I'm wondering how that's going to go. I'm wondering if all the airlines are going to mm. panic and give away cheaper flights because they want to try and recoup their, their lost profits or if it's going to go the other way and it's just going to become insanely expensive for the same reason. I was uh, listening yesterday on the radio that like one of the options was like to to make some social distancing into the into the airplane, which doesn't make any sense because the same air is like... Circulating, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense. And so, like, and, and of course, like how much those tickets could be because like they need to fill up like all of those prizes and all that. So like, yeah. I don't know. It's gonna be, it's gonna be tough, I would say for, for them. Um, yeah, even if even if they ease those restrictions now in the UK and they were like, oh, we're going to open the bars again and stuff like that, I wouldn't go in them. Like, no, so am I. I mean, because it's going to go in spikes. Like the the deaths are going to slow down, then they're going to go up again. But it, because there's no there's no cure, so it's just exactly, like... exactly. It's crazy, and and I, I was to be honest with you, I was one of those people who was saying, ah, it's a bullshit, whatever. It's going to be like just a flu or something like that. But then, like when I saw the numbers, I saw like the, the the how it affected people and all that. I started to realize it was like something something like pretty tough to deal with, and so like I started to say, okay, I better stay home. I better not go around. I might you know infect my parents, my relatives, or whatever. So it's tough. yeah, yeah. It's tough. Oh yeah, when you start seeing when you start seeing those figures of just the people dying that's going up by the thousands in the day, that's you can't only a moron would ignore that. Yeah, and the fact the fact that China just aren't China China aren't releasing honest figures. Like I guarantee they've a lot more people have died of it than they're letting on. Like they don't yeah. admit to them with rehabilitation camps, so they're not going to admit to all the people that are dying in their own country. Um, let's move away from this very quickly because I hate when people just get stuck talking about this. When are you releasing your red wheels, red eye wheels part? Because you promised me one at Winter Clash, and I've not seen anything yet. So. Yeah. It, it will be, I mean, like, we were supposed to, uh, uh, so first thing first, tomorrow, we are going to uh, announce something, because tomorrow I'm going to make the blading chat with the, with Buck, which is like the owner of uh, of Red Eye, and we yeah. are announcing um, something. Uh, yeah, another and, another bald man with a beard. <laughs> exactly. And uh, with that being said, if, like, uh, I'm able to film something before September, I'm going to release something in September, because... On September of the 2000, uh, I've started skating the September of 2000. So it's mm -hmm. going to be my 20th uh, anniversary of skating. So... You've only been skating 20 years. God, you're such a noob. Don't even talk to me. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, with that, with that being said, uh, um, hopefully if everything works out and, and stuff like that, uh, um, something will be released in, in um, September. So, it I mean, like... It it better be a pro wheel because as far as I remember, no Italian has ever had a pro wheel or a pro skate. Never. Both. Although I was thinking, is Matteo Atanasio has a pro oxygen, but I don't remember where he was from. In Germany, Munich. Ah. Probably, probably he was <laughs> like, uh, he, his parents, they were like Italian and he was growing up right. in, uh, just like Cosmo yeah, no, there's, there's never been an Italian pro wheel, has there? Never. So really it might, I might like, be like the very first man. Yeah. yeah, like you guys have got a way better climate than like most of Europe. You've got all the ledge spots, like the famous like Milan train station and stuff like that, like fam like massively famous, iconic like street spots that are in all the skateboarding videos. But you've never had any pros. You, you know what? Like I do believe I, I like thinking about this topic for like a long time because it always surprises me. I do think that like um, we have never had like a, a really strong, um, I wouldn't say strong culture in skating because we have it, but like uh, strong figures. Like uh, for example, the 
there was like Nicola Fiorenza, Francesco Sili, and Mauro Moy, and those guys were like the my idols when I started skating. And before them, there were like other people, but at the level of the internationals, probably the only one that we ever had was uh, Francesco Sili and Nicola Fiorenza. In the, yeah. And maybe, I don't know if you ever heard about this guy, Luca Calzamatta. Like er, uh, during the early 90s, he was like one of those, um, the main like Team Roches guy. Like he was flying, he, he like, he went everywhere here in Europe. He did like the ASA and, and all that. But unfortunately, he went into the path of a drug and whatever. But like uh, with that being said, like I do believe that like um, we weren't able to look up to those guys and to do better. You know what I mean? Like I see, I see the people in France, for example. They had, I don't know, Thierry Le Lemon, they had Newman, they had like Wilfred Rossignol. And then you have like people like uh, Roman Abrat and then uh, 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 Adrian Ann, Mathias Silan. And then you have kids like Julian Cudo. And then after Julian Cudo, you have Nicolas Servi. Uh, in, in the UK, you have um, uh, Chaz, you have Queenie. And then after Queenie, you have like someone new, you know, like kids are like looking for like the pro at the time and try to make better. Back then, like in Italy, we never had get this, this, this drive, you know, to do better than that. Or maybe just because we are lazy as, uh, as Italians. Or, but like, Typically, just, you guys were too busy just eating all the good food and chasing after those beautiful women. That's, that was the problem. And, and, enjoy the, and enjoy the good weather. So, I mean... Yeah, yeah. Just go to the beach. Yeah. Um, and, and, but like, I see it like, uh, I don't want to be and look with you like a... Like a a selfish guy or whatever, but I see the evolution in like how the, the kids here in Milan are improving right now because I see my brother ha having me as an example of skating and he like, he, um, uh, how can I say, surpasses me skating wise, like in, I don't know, three, four years. And then we saw he's, our coaching. He's, he's, he's not got those true self passes. <laughs> he's not. That's the only thing I can do. He, he <laughs> wishes he could do those true self passes. <laughs> But my, 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 my cousin, you know, like Matthew, Matthew Reyes, the guy who just like uh, came out like on, on the Razor team, he started skating like two years ago and he's like super crazy good on those tricks and whatever because probably he, see, he skates all the time with me and Garbel and like, oh, of course, the other guys and ex as well as uh, Giuseppe, the guy from, uh, from the Rochester team. I mean, they are looking at like people like me or like other and like they, right now they're trying to, you know, make the step forward but maybe i don't know it's just me that like yeah that, yeah like well the uk always had like a really strong history in blade and like had loads of videos from really early on and weirdly enough there was like pro skates during the late 90s that would only get released in the uk so or like there was like the, the video game rolling it only came out in the uk which is just insane it didn't come out in the states even no. though it was, even though John Hillio was behind it and it was developed there. Like it was, it was only released commercially in the UK. That's why they had the release party in Rampworks. Doesn't make any sense because like, of course, aggressive in line was pretty cool, but like, I mean, it, no, it's because they, saw, like, they, they had the biggest sales. Like the UK at one point had, the UK at one point had like 20 skate shops, like as in not, not like, not, not skate shops. They had like, like 20, like aggressive skate shops. No way. It was, there was, a time when you'd open Unity magazine and like every few pages would just be a British shop. Crazy. Um, Crazy. But yeah, and nothing, Italy, you don't, there's not really much coverage coming out from Italy either because you, you don't ever see Italian full length videos. No, like the only guys that like are like really active uh, about that, they are those from Flabby Muscle. I don't know if you ever heard about these guys. They used to do like some Bloody stuff. Muscle. Oh yeah, no, no, that's what I mean. Like obviously like you guys have had like edits and stuff like that, but there's never been like one, there's a, never- A proper like a yeah. 40 minutes video, right? At least I don't remember one growing up. And no, now- the, there were, but like they only like, probably because of the level of the, or the connection or whatever, we never get the chance, you know, to break through the, the, the border. So like we had, I do have like uh, here in my collection, three, no, four Italian DVDs, full length, like 45 minutes with like B-roll and, uh, and uh, oh, Jeff said uh, he had one. Which one do you have, Jeff? I, I don't know what he means by it. Yeah, is he referencing the same thing? <laughs> and, but, but yeah, I mean, like there's, there wasn't like uh, a proper, I don't know, 
Grindhouse or Local Skate selling, you know, a proper Italian DVD back then. Okay. But there's not like, there's not crews apart from Flabby Muscles, which let's be honest, they're all, it's all older guys. It's all like guys like us, like us. no one, sorry, you're significantly better at rollerblading than I am, but it's all old people. No, like no young guys want to watch old people rollerblading. Um, are there any crews actually making videos though? Mm, to be honest with you, besides Instagram things, no. God, unfortunately, Jeff, Jeff's just leaving comments. We're not talking about roll kings and, and <laughs> online skate shops. We're talking about when there were proper skate shops, like shop shops, like walk into the shop shop. <laughs> and um, sorry, I interrupted you. Crews then, in Italy making videos. Yeah, like they're only make like Instagram edits. I mean, like, and here in Italy, the crazy thing is the fact that like there are like bladers, like we. We have like here in Milan, in the whole area of Milan, there are like at least like 50, 60 bladers, but like, you know, they're standing there, they're parked kind of, uh, kind of uh, lazy and like they don't want to. Um, I mean, I, I, I do believe it's like the same everywhere, like where you have like small crews hanging there and like barely showed up somewhere, you know. But skateboarding's big in Italy, isn't it? Because I know there's, there's a there's Italian pro skateboarders because there's a guy that's on there's a guy that's on Baker that's from Milan. Yeah, Jacopo Carazzi, a good friend of mine. Yeah, Jacopo. Jacopo is like. A... So like if you would think if they have a skateboarding culture, then at one point there must have been a rollerblading culture. That's why because, I'm here. No, I'm just <laughs> they, they were obviously like clashing at one point. No, no, there there are like uh, I've done, I've done one of these blading chats like. Uh, Three days ago, with a good friend of mine, skateboarder Rene Olivo, which is which is like one of the main skateboarder um, at the main train station, which is like Stazione Centrale, the marble spot you were talking earlier about it. Yeah. And, um, and like we are like really uh, well connected. Like I know him since like the day he came here in Italy in 2003 because he's originally from uh, South Africa. And um, and so yeah, the skateboarding scene is pretty pretty. Um, strong here in Italy. There's like a, one guy won the X Game Bowl competition this year, Italian guy. Okay. So if you think about it, and like, and also the surf wise, we do have like Leonardo Fioravanti who beat three times uh, Kelly Slater. So I mean, like, and, and, and also in BMXing, we do have uh, Alexandro Barbero or Simone Barraco who like won X Games and, and so on. So Okay. In the other sports, like, we are good. Yeah. Blading, not really. <laughs> and you guys have got the spots because, like, the most, well, the most footage I've seen of Italy in the last, like, five years is the section you made of your brother on them skates, <laughs> which was really good. Actually, loads of that was in Barcelona, wasn't it? No, Milano, Milano. We filmed it in, oh, uh, yeah. We filmed yeah, it in three, three, three sessions in Milano. Uh, the one you made of your cousin and then Nils's two roaches, roaches, Edit. And that's that's literally the most I've seen Italian footage of, maybe since you made the one with. Didn't you make one when Edwin? Edwin, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Like, but that was years ago. It was so like many... 2015. Yeah. No, 2014. Yeah, yeah because like... he passed in 15. Yeah, so like six, yeah, almost seven, six, seven years. I must say, yeah, six years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. so like it's it, it's great, like. Think about how terrible the weather is in the UK. Like in Scotland, yeah. in Scotland it rains all the fucking oh, time. Lord. All the spots are dog shit. Like every, every spot, you need either a bit of wood for the run up or the landing. And yet we've produced all these skaters in, under the most horrible circumstances. Like imagine if we had, imagine, if we, imagine if we had the weather, we'd be so productive. It'd be so much, yeah, so. You're lazy. Uh, Dave, like, there's like this countdown here because probably after one hour, I've just realized it like uh, Instagram will uh, will shut me down. So okay. I'm afraid to, like uh, uh, we need to close it here. That's, but it's that's cool. is I need to get back to the father duties or my partner's gonna kill me. Definitely. So I'm looking forward to see you one day with your family here in Italy, so I can show you around and we can share and eat some pizza or like one of those other like beautiful dishes. Okay. Yeah, I think I could get away with convincing her of that because I could say, well, we'll go and we can do the whole, like, thing, but I'm going to need to go skating one day. So, yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I can, I can get away with that, I think.
So, David, I do really thank you for your time. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Jeff, for, for posting comments. They, you too, man. These are really good. I, I think the best things that have come out of the whole like, coronavirus thing is this, because you've got uh, like something to look at. Like, people have got something to look forward to every day, and you're doing it with, like, well, apart from me, people that people actually want to hear from. And then all the games of online Blade that people are doing. Like, I absolutely really love watching, crazy. especially if like, you like one of the guys or you happen to like two of the guys, and then you're just watching them just go at it. Like, <laughs> we, have um, five, we have five seconds. We have five, five seconds before they shut up. Well, in that case, thank you very much. Thank and, you very uh, much, David. Keep it up. Bye. 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 Bye.